Would you join me as we pray? Oh God, we give you thanks for the gift of Christ's resurrection. We give you thanks for the gift of this place where we come together in worship, we come together in fellowship to learn more about who it is you call us to be as your followers. And so we pray that you would come and fill this place with your spirit, that you would quiet our minds, open our hearts to the word you have for us today. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth would not be my own, but that they would be your words for your church. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, happy week after Easter. We had a wonderful day last Sunday, and I'm glad to see all of you here this morning. And as we consider the gift, as we consider the power of Christ's resurrection, it's important for us to consider now how we live because of that especially when it comes to the world that we live in, when it comes to our mindset as followers of Jesus. And one of the things that informs us about what's going on around us in our city, in our state, our country, our world, are headlines. Whether they come from a newspaper or a magazine or TV, internet, social media. So this morning I wanted to share some with you that were actually false, that were untrue, But when I searched for that, all that kept coming up was fake news, whatever that means. Um, And so that was maddening, so I gave up on that, switched gears to amusing headlines instead. So here are a few of those. A new sick policy requires two-day notice. A cold wave is linked to temperatures. Psychics predict the world did not end yesterday. And finally, a Florida couple is arrested for selling tickets to heaven. Now that one makes you want to know more, doesn't it? Yeah, it did me. I was intrigued. That was the most intriguing to me. So I read what appeared to be this newspaper article about this, that this couple, they were selling these tickets to heaven for $100 a piece. They were made out of solid gold. Um, and they reserved a spot for whoever bought them, a spot in heaven. And they claimed that Jesus gave them to them directly behind a KFC somewhere. And so the man told the police, well, you need to arrest Jesus. Don't arrest me. And he even offered to wear a wire to set Jesus up. Um, Now, really, these were pieces of wood that they had spray-painted gold and written with a marker that it was a ticket to heaven. He also had a baby alligator with him. Um, when they when they arrested him now I had to know was this really true Um, did this really happen and so I did some more research and alas it was not true but it made a good headline it was it was entertaining but seriously how many of you feel completely overwhelmed with the headlines nowadays whatever the source and so I want to talk today about what it means for us to write our own headlines what that looks like And so to do that, I want to look at a passage from Colossians. And so I'd invite you to listen and receive the word of God for us today. Therefore, if you were raised with Christ, look for the things that are above, where Christ is sitting at God's right side. Think about the things above and not things on earth. You died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Colossians is a short letter. It's only four chapters, easy to read, attributed to Paul. And so it's thought that he's in Rome. He's writing from prison. And he's writing because there had been heresy, false teachings about Jesus that were infiltrating the church. And so all four of the chapters in Colossians center around this theme of redemption that we find in Christ. But I want to unpack some of the language that he uses in these three verses, because it can be a little bit confusing. So in the first verse, he says, therefore, if you were raised with Christ. Now, likely what he's talking about here is baptism, that in our baptism, we are resurrected to a new life with Jesus. And at the end of verse one, he tells us that Jesus is in heaven. And so in effect, we are called to live now as if we are already with Jesus. Now, the the message translation says it this way. 
If you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. That's what it says. And then going on into verse 2, he says, think about the things above and not the things that are on earth. And again, the message translation there is, pursue the things over which Christ presides. See things from his perspective. Another way of saying that that might be more familiar to you is to set your mind on things above. That means that we judge everything in light of the cross, in light of this love that gave itself for us. And it allows us to see all of the world's stuff at its true value. And then to embrace a new set of values, things that last, things that matter to God and to God's purposes. So really what this is all about is transformation. Transformation of our hearts, of our souls, of our minds. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says, don't be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then in verse 3, he says, you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. There's a lot of speculation about what he means there. I actually think it's possible that multiple things can be true here. I'll share a few of them. Um, One is that it could mean that we are buried not dead, but hidden in God, the place where all true wisdom, all true knowledge lies, perhaps undiscerned by the wider world. Or it may speak to the idea that some things in our lives are a mystery. They are hidden. There are no easy answers or meaning for them, and thus we have to live by faith, which is what God calls us to do. My favorite image is that baptism wraps Christ around us, that we are hidden in a place of intimacy, a place of security with Christ. And so as we think about the state of the world, as we think about headlines that bombard us on a daily basis, it's easy for us to feel overwhelmed by that. Some of those things may not even be true, but most of them want some sort of response out of us. And the ones that are true, the ones that are factual, Focus on hard things that are happening around us, maybe things that directly affect our lives in some way. And so it makes sense that we feel discouraged or defeated or afraid or anxious, which all of those things then begin to breed a sense of negativity. And so on a scale of one to 10, with one being not so great, 10 being pretty good, how positive is your mindset today about life in general? And how do we sift through all of, this, all of this stuff in a healthy way? Is it even possible for us to see the positive? I think so, but only if and when we set our mind on things above, when we set our mind on Jesus. So when we do that, when we set our minds on Christ, it allows us to reframe our stories. Obviously, we live on earth, And so we must be concerned about what happens in our lives. We need to be concerned about our relationships. And it's important to understand that Paul is not suggesting that we completely withdraw from from everything outside of the church. That's not what he's saying. But our new life with Christ through faith is an assured reality for us that defines our values, that helps shape the decisions that we make. And so, in essence, we can't always change our circumstances, but with God's help, we can change our perspective. There's an idea called cognitive reframing, and what that means is it's a way that we shift our mindset to see a situation in a positive way, from a positive perspective. We look for what's right versus what's wrong, look for what's good versus what's not so good, helps us turn things that are challenges in our lives into opportunities a situation that may feel hopeless, and instead we can claim the truth that my God is always with me and my God is for me. I want to show you an example of this, an example of cognitive reframing that's in the Bible. Going to the Old Testament, uh, the book of Numbers, and if you're just starting to read the Bible, I don't recommend you start there, Uh, but that's where we're going to go right now, Numbers chapter 13. The Israelites have just been delivered from Egypt, and they're camping in the desert. And God tells Moses to send some men to explore Canaan, which was the promised land. 
And so he does. He sends 12, one from each of the ancestral tribes, and he tells them to go and inspect the land and to inspect the people that they find there. And the questions that he asks them are things like, is the land good or bad? Are the people there strong or are they weak? Are there a lot of people there? What about the towns? Are there trees? These are the things he's interested in. And so they go, they're gone for 40 days, and they come back with very different reports of what they find. Joshua and Caleb say, the land is great. It's full of milk and honey. God is with us, and so yes, we should go and we should take that land. The others say, we can't take the land. Their people are stronger than us. That land devours people. The men are so large that we look like grasshoppers compared to them. It really says that, that we look like grasshoppers compared to them. And so here we have the exact same situation. They're seeing the exact same thing, but they have two entirely different perspectives. Joshua and Caleb have a positive outlook. Their headline might have been, God is with us, this land will bless us. All the other were, others have a negative outlook. Their headline may have been, danger lurks, this land eats people. And so we may not like the circumstances that we find ourselves in, but we have an assurance that God is present, that God is working in all things. And we can't always change what's happening out there, but God can change what's happening inside of us, in our minds, in our hearts. And so when we set our minds on Christ, when we change our perspective, then we learn to write our own headlines. Our lives are not defined by someone else's headlines. Not the media, not the government or politics, not our jobs, not something that someone else has done to us. And so what's your headline today for your life? What challenge are you facing? What pain might you be enduring? What question can you not answer? What hurt do you have that nobody else knows about? God can and will do something in and through all of those things, but you get to choose what the headline's going to be. You choose what you'll believe. Maybe a headline that reads, healing process begins, or finally finds freedom and forgiveness. When we set our minds on Christ, when we write our own headlines from his perspective, then we are able to carry out God's work in the world in new ways. That might be helping someone else reframe their story in light of God's goodness, or creating new positive headlines for the world around you, whether that be in your home or at work, in your school, in the community, and specifically in our relationships. Instead of picking people apart and finding ways that other people are wrong, we can look for ways to love, look for ways to share grace. I read an article this week about Gen Z. It's the generation of, of those who are currently ages 12 to 27. And it's stated that they are the most disillusioned, pessimistic generation ever. Over the last decade, it, it's had the steepest rise in negativity among young people in history. And there was a poll among 12th grade students across the country, and 40% of them, 40%, almost half, said that it's hard for them to have hope for the world. 30% of them wonder if there's any purpose to life, given the world they see around them. That was staggering to me. It was concerning to me. Many of them said that they have very low expectations about their future. And all of these things are attributed in large part to a few things. One is texting, um, this idea that they lack face-to-face -face relationships a lot of the time, social media, and the current state of the world, what they see, what they hear. Now, this generation often gets a bad rap with older generations, that they're antisocial, that they're addicted to technology, that they're negative, that they're lazy, but in reality, they're stressed. They are anxious, they're scared, to name a few things. 
So as the church, how about we rise up and help them? Because we have a responsibility to help our young people write their own headlines. Not the headlines of their friends or the media, but those of Jesus. To help them know that their lives do matter. That they can make a difference. They will make a difference. And that goes for the younger generation coming up behind them too. We will always find what we look for. If we're determined to find the negative, it will appear in the news, in our relationships, in our jobs, in the church. But when we have eyes to see how God is at work, we can then be a light in the world, the light that God calls us to be. Christ's resurrection initiated a new order, a new order in which we become participants, and so we get to join in God's work and make a difference. And so, Consider these questions. Is worship a routine exercise for us? Is it just a box that we check once a week? Or is it an experience that's shaped by a real encounter with Jesus? Do we have a heavenly mindedness that transforms every part of our life? That we see everything in relation to Jesus as Lord of our lives? Because Christ is risen, we don't give up. There is no power in the universe that's able to affect those who put their trust in Christ. And that's good news. That gives us hope. That gives us assurance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, so we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside Where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. And so we fix our eyes on what is unseen. So let us pursue the things of Jesus. Let's see things from his perspective. Because by God's grace, our headlines can be made new every day, every morning. And so as we come today to this table, to the communion table, there's an important piece of news, a headline from a very good God that's intended for each of us that says, I love you. You are mine. Come and receive my grace. Thanks be to God for that gift. Amen.